good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our Sunday evening time of worship, Bible study. Continuing in our study of the book of Galatians tonight. And uh, like I said, it kind of goes hand in hand with uh, what we covered this morning. Church, a little bit different aspect, though. But uh, several things to mention as we get started. Uh, if you are interested in getting your information, uh, your address, phone number, and so forth in our church directory, as if it's not in there, or if it needs to be updated, uh, let us know. Get that information to our office. You can call tomorrow uh, when the office opens up. You can write it down, hand it to myself or Joycelyn or Miss Betty, and uh, we'll be updating that and trying to roll that out here in the next month or two. Um, Many other things to look at in the bulletin are Daylight Savings Time Fish Fry, Churchwide Fish Fry and Fellowship on March the 10th. Uh, fellowship time will start at 5 p.m. and the meal will be served at 6 p.m. If you can help out with that, uh, please let us know. We will have a BCM uh, worship time on Sunday, March the 17th at our normal Worship time on Sunday morning. Con and his group will come. They'll lead us in worship. He'll bring the message. Just an opportunity for you to get feedback from some of the students at the BCM. This is something that we are invested in. Uh, we send them uh, funds to go throughout the year, uh, doing outreach and, and doing other fellowships throughout the year. But we also go once a semester and bring them a meal. And then we are scheduled to go on the 18th, Monday the 18th, uh, to bring them lunch uh, at the BCM. So if you are willing to help cook, prepare, and go and serve on that day, uh, let Miss Kathy know, and she will get you connected and let you know the dates and the time to be available for that. This Saturday, uh, man, we have our breakfast fellowship at Unity One Baptist Church in Centerville, uh, the 17th at 8 a.m. If you're interested in going, let me know. We'll meet here in the parking lot of the church. We'll carpool together. And uh, ladies, I promise I'll bring them back safe and sound. Uh, we'll, we'll go check out and see what's going on on the bayou and uh, maybe go catch a few fish. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But uh, it's always a good time to get together with the men of our association. Uh, we have a time of, of eat. They always have a real good breakfast. Uh, we have a, a word from Brother Chris Holloway. He usually brings a devotional for us and a few songs of worship. It's just a good all-around time of fellowship. So let me know if you're interested in going to that as well. And then I'm excited about this when our friends, uh, the Lizenby family, We Are Called, will be back for a night of prayer and praise on February the 21st. Uh, they called the other day, kind of a last-minute change of their schedule. They were available to come through. Uh, I said, yes, by all means, come and be with us on that day. And uh, we are looking forward to that. Get the word out. Uh, as you see those posts on social media, uh, share them with those within your group and help us just to get the word out that they are coming. This is open to everyone. Uh, they said they will come on a love offering only. And so we're excited about that. They'll actually get here on that Tuesday to set up. Uh, we'll feed them that evening, and then they'll have a uh, time of worship here on Wednesday night. You're going to love these guys if you didn't get to catch them. No, we're going to do it inside. I have a feeling the mosquitoes will be hungry on that night, and it probably would not work well uh, this time of year. So we're going to do that one inside. And the weather's so unpredictable right now, I'd, I'd rather just do it in here. All right, so uh, we're going to have a little time of prayer uh, I got word a while ago that in Houston at uh, Lakewood Church there was a shooting this afternoon. Uh, I don't have all of the details. I know that there was one fatality. It was a shooter and then two injuries is what I saw on the news report. So uh, this is a church. This is a body of Christ. And uh, we just want to take some time and pray over that. Uh, I know what the enemy's trying to do, but uh, we would just want to pray that uh, situations like that uh, would be few and far between. But we want to pray right now for... Uh, the victims, those injured, and the families involved. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Just a few moments of silence as you pray over that.
Almighty Father, we come before you this evening, Lord God, thanking you for our love for us, Lord. Thank you for your love for us. And thank you for our relationship that we can have with you, Lord God. We thank you for uh, your guidance and your protection and the strength that only you can bring. And Lord God, as we studied uh, just a few weeks ago, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And Lord, you give us comfort so that in times of need, others can be comforted as well. And right now, Lord God, the body is hurting. Uh, as someone has uh, sought to inflict pain and harm on our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord God, it's also uh, your will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right now, Lord God, I don't know all the details of the situation in Houston. You do. But I know that the enemy is at work. And I know his intention is to create chaos and confusion and harm within the body. And Lord, we stand against that. Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bind you. and We plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ over his church. He's promised that you would not have the victory, Satan. We claim that victory, that it belongs to us. Jesus himself said that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So right now, Lord God, I lift up the families of those involved in this shooting for the shooter and the victims, Lord God. We, we don't know what caused this. We don't know uh, why this event happened. But I pray for all of the people that are involved, Lord God, all the families who are uh, right now in need of comfort, that you would comfort them in a way that only you can. I pray that you'll just give them the peace of God that surpasses all understanding through this situation. And Lord, as they sort through these pieces, I just pray that uh, between the families of those injured and the families of the one that caused the harm, Lord God, that there would be no hard feelings, that there would be forgiveness. And we just pray, Lord God, that you would just uh, take control of this situation in the way that only you can. And Lord, we pray that you would protect our churches, your churches, from any further harm from incidents like this. God, I pray that tonight as we gather together to worship, that you would place your angels of protection around this building, this facility. You would ward off anyone that is wanting to do harm or evil towards us, Lord God. You would show us, Lord God, you give us wisdom how we can protect ourselves against situations like that. And right now, Lord God, as our uh, hearts are still longing to uh, see comfort and healing in these, the lives of these families, Lord, I pray that this time that we have together this evening, that you would focus our attention on you, that the name of Jesus would be lifted up. And as we sing our songs of praise, Lord God, that our voices would just echo. Our voices would unite and our voices would lift up the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. As we open your word, Lord God, I pray that you would impart to us some wisdom that we need to see from your word on how to live godly and righteous, fulfilling your will here on this earth, Lord God, and fulfilling the Great Commission. And we just pray that you'll guide us in all that we do, and we just ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I will listen to what the, the God of heaven will say. Who are you listening to today? Are you hearing from him? You know, one way to hear from him for sure is read the Bible. So read his word and then meditate. See what he has to say to you. Let's sing, speak to my heart. Would you stand? <laughs> Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus, speak that my soul may hear, speak to my heart, Lord Jesus, come every doubt and fear, speak Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Again in Psalm chapter 51, verse 7, the scripture says, Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Have you asked him lately to wash you, to just cleanse you from whatever burdens you carry, whatever? Uh, as, as the pastor mentioned some things this morning that we are not supposed to do, as in maybe anger or lose our temper, that kind of stuff. wash me, make me whiter than snow. Let's sing. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly chapter 5, verse 11, it says the disciples pulled their boats up on shore and they left everything and followed Jesus. What about it? Are we leaving things? Are we following? Who are we following? Think about this as we sing this song. Sweetly, Lord, I've heard thee calling. Okay. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, calling, calling. And we see where the footprints falling lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the Steps of Jesus, where? 
That second song we sang had a verse in it. To those who sought thee, he never said no. Think about that for just a moment. Aren't you glad that you're a person that he never said no to? Aren't you glad that you're someone that he said yes to when you called out his name and asked him to save you? He gladly said, yes, I will. You know it's going to be a long sermon when a preacher gets up with two Bibles in his hand, don't you? <laughs> three points, three verses. Uh, I promise you, I'm, I'm, buckle up. We're going to run through it as quick as we can. But I, I, I got something that I think we're going to, we're all going to get something out of here. Uh, it'll help you not only in your life and in your walk with the Lord, but uh, as you minister to other people as well. Because I know I've had several people in the past few weeks come up to me and say, hey, Brother Tracy, I'm struggling. You know, what, what advice do you have? And I'll start asking them these different things and giving them different analogies. So I think tonight's really going to shed a lot of light on that and, and help you out maybe in your walk and, and help you as you minister to others who may be struggling in their walk as well. As you know, um, I run a little bit, and me and Marcy walk in the evenings. And uh, something I've noticed is that your pace, your gait, your steps often vary depending on what's going on. A lot of times I'll listen to music or sermons while I'm running. And I've noticed that depending on what kind of song it is, my step will be kind of in beat with the music. I don't get into them 138 beats per minute workout music. I don't do that when I'm running. But uh, I have noticed that a lot of times Marcia and I, when we're walking, it is much easier when we're taking the same steps. Even though my stride is a lot longer than hers and I can take a lot more steps along the way that she can. I've noticed that if, I, if my steps match her, it's just easier for us to keep up together. But I, I've often noticed as well sometimes that when one of us is walking and maybe we get distracted by something, we'll get a text message and we're trying to fumble it along. The other person will lag behind a lot because they're distracted. Their steps get shorter. They're not really focused on the other person. That gap between us gets to be larger and larger. Or maybe we're distracted by something we see. We want to stop and take a picture of it. Different things along the way will distract us and our, our distance between the two of us will sometimes get separated. Well, when that happens, it's, it's a lot more difficult for us to communicate. I have tinnitus ringing in my ears, so when she's walking up ahead of me and talking, trying to say something, I'm struggling to catch back up. What'd you say just a minute ago? And so marching along, walking along, whatever you want to view it as, uh, a lot of times when you're walking with someone else, uh, it's a lot easier when you are keeping the same pace, keeping up side by side. In step is the easiest for both of us. Uh, many of you have been in the military before. Uh, one of the first things that you learn how to do, one of the very first things they teach you in boot camp is how to get together with your platoon or your troop and you're marching at the same step, the same beat. You got one person telling you when to go, when to stop, when to halt, when to turn left, when to turn right, and everybody's doing the same thing at the same time, and it's done for a specific reason because that's your platoon, and you're not to be separated, but you also don't want to get 
mixed up with maybe someone else's platoon. In the ancient empires, they, they first developed uh, the act of walking or marching with their troops. They developed it as a way of moving troops from one place to another without getting them mixed up with other troops. And so a, sur- a soldier that is learning how to march, he, he learns how to march to the cadence of a drum, something that's keeping the same pace for everyone to make steps on. Uh, maybe music, maybe shouted commands, but it is an essential element of teaching military discipline. So I want you to keep those two things in mind as we go through this sermon. Uh, There's another element of biblical interpretation that I want you to pay attention to as we go through this. We've talked about repetition of words, looking for a writer who is saying maybe the same word over and over for emphasis. We've talked about list, and tonight we're going to talk about something that is a comparison or a contrast. We're seeing both of those take place here in these next three verses. All throughout the letter of Galatians, Paul is writing to this church. He said, look, beware of false teachers. Beware of the Judaizers. Beware of those that say you must adhere to the law to obtain salvation. He's preaching against legalism. He's teaching them how to avoid it. And all along, he's kind of setting up for what we're going to get into in the next few weeks here in chapter 5 and chapter 6. Chapter 5 Uh, Verse 22 is one that I used this morning. We're going to look at it a little bit tonight. But the comparison and contrast that Paul is talking about here, he's saying, look, no matter where you stand in the law, no matter what your outlook is on legalism, you're either walking in the spirit or you're walking in the flesh. And after he talks about walking in the spirit, he then gets into the list, that itemized list that we talked about this morning, Characteristics of someone who's living a fleshly life. They're still in their sin and they, are, they have certain characteristics that they exhibit. Then he talks about those who are living in the spirit and the fruits that they produce. And so I'm going to read to you out of the New Living Translation. Uh, I've kind of grown attached to it uh, over the past few uh, weeks as I go through some of these studies. The only issue with it is it's hard to find it because it's in chronological order and uh, it's not like the, the Bible that you read right now. So give me just a few minutes. I'm going to find I did have it marked, but I don't know what happened to my marker in it. We're going to stand tonight, Galatians chapter 5. And uh, we're going to read verses 16 through 18. So the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Galatia. He's warning against legalism, but he's giving some very, very practical application here in chapter 5. Beginning in verse 16, he says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. I would have to say that's probably about 85 to 90% of the issue with most Christians today is they are not letting the Holy Spirit guide and direct their lives. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. New King James Version that I use says lust there in place of the word craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. There's your comparison and contrast there. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. Nobody in this room is exempt from that. You've got a battle raging on inside of you. Your spirit is constantly battling against your flesh. The one you feed is going to be the one that survives the most. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Father God, we thank you for this formula that you give us of walking in the Spirit as in opposition to what the flesh flesh lusts after. And we just pray, Lord God, that you would reveal to us tonight what we need to see in this passage. 
We thank you for what you did through the life of the Apostle Paul, for the work that he did while he was here on this earth, these incredible letters that you were able to provide to us through him. And we just pray, Lord God, that we'll be able to glean something out of this passage tonight. And over the next few weeks as we get into this uh, practical application part of the letter, Lord God, that we'll be walking in step with your Holy Spirit every step of the way in our lives. And we'll be able to help others, Lord God, who may be falling behind. Maybe, maybe there's someone who is not marching to the same beat as we are that needs to step up the pace a little bit. But I pray, Lord God, that you would just strengthen us and guide us through this time and speak to us in this moment. We just ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the answers to the three uh, points here in my sermon. Uh, number one, have you been neutralized? Number two, is your spirit paralyzed? And number three, are you being mobilized? Have you been neutralized? What does that mean? The Apostle Paul opens up by saying, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does it mean that when we're neutralized, the body is still physically capable of moving, but there's an external force that has captured it and rendered it useless at the moment. Psalms chapter 1 gives a picture of a man. It's a blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. We're talking about blessings on Sunday morning. You want to be blessed, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. But he's talking about this aspect, the same aspect that the Apostle Paul is talking about. He's, where are you walking at? Are you walking with the godly or are you walking with the ungodly? But he kind of gives a regression of this man going from walking to standing still and then into a sitting position. He becomes neutralized. He is still physically capable of walking as he did at one time. But for some reason or another, he has gotten with the wrong crowd. And his walk with the Lord has been completely neutralized. What are some of the reasons that the enemy can have you neutralized? Go down to verse 21. This is that list that we looked at earlier. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and their likes. He goes on and on with the list of things that the flesh lusts after. So this list that he gives from verse 20 to verse 21, if you are practicing any of these, your walk with the Lord is at a standstill. The enemy has you neutralized and you are no longer walking according to the Spirit. You're walking in the works of the flesh and they are evident. And he gives a crystal clear picture of someone who is living in the flesh and the things that they practice. This word walk here in verse 16, it is a Greek word peripateo, and it means to walk up and down. Walk in the spirit. Walk up and down. Who is it that's walking up and down? He's talking about the Holy Spirit walking up and down in your life. It gives the picture of a teacher who is walking up and down the aisles of students as he teaches there are several definitions and several different references to the spirit and the word spirit. We've talked about the word parakletos, which means parallel, or walking alongside of. But another thing that, the, that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would do while he was here on this earth, he says he will teach you in all the things that I have commanded you. So you can see the Holy Spirit walking up and down the aisles of your mind and your life teaching you the things that you need to learn, teaching you how to not walk according to the lust of the flesh. And this verse 16, like I mentioned this morning, if you flip it around, it makes even more sense. First of all, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if you walk according to the lust of the flesh, guess what? You're not gonna fulfill the works of the spirit in your life because you are going to be neutralized in your walk. Now, there's two places in this passage where Paul uses the word walk. Here in verse 16, and then further down in verse 25. The same word, but it has two different meanings. Remember, context is everything. The first time he uses it in verse 16, it is the Greek word peripateo. 
Second time he uses it in verse 25, it is the word stoicheo, which means a military march or keeping in step. So what does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit first has to teach you something, how to walk according to the Spirit and not be neutralized by the lust of the flesh. And then the second time he uses, he says, once you learn how to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit, you can then walk in sync or synchronized with the Holy Spirit leading you, guiding you, and teaching you all things. The first definition, a teacher walking up and down the aisles, pointing out things in your life, showing you your mistakes, teaching you what you need to learn. The Holy Spirit as a teacher in our life. Why does this play into the contrast and conflict that occurs in the life of a new believer? Let's go back to the teaching and training principle that we talked about this morning. I brought the kids down and I asked them about uh, animals. I asked them about what they've learned in Sunday school. They had to have a teacher. They had to have someone to to relay that information and show them maybe through an example or a cartoon or a coloring sheet. How many of you, maybe late in life, attempted to learn something new, maybe a new skill or a new language or something like that? It's not quite as easy as it used to be, is it? That's why we need the Holy Spirit in our life because we can't always learn as quickly as we need to. The Holy Spirit guides us and teaches us in those things. Sometimes the older we get, the more difficult it is to learn those life lessons or those critical skills that we need to learn. If you don't believe me, just give an older person an electronic device like a cell phone or an iPad and say, here, learn how to use this. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? Hand them an electronic device and see how many questions you get asked about how to use this. What does this button do? <laughs> what is an app? What is an app? What is an app for? What does this app do? How do I speed dial on my phone? Where's the button at that I use my speed dial with? <laughs> I, I didn't do that. I, I know I pushed the right button, but I, I didn't make it do that. Well, it didn't do it on its own. But sometimes the older we get, the harder it is to learn how to use it. I got a new laptop several years ago, and I'm, I was used to using the mouse, and I got one that had a mouse pad on it. I struggled a little bit learning how to use that new laptop. It was a different brand than what I was used used to using. And my oldest son was there. I said, dude, I said, look, I can move the cursor around. I can click on different things. How do you make the page scroll down, though? He looked at me. He went, I said, what is that, some kind of gangster sign or something? What are you talking? He said, no, you put two fingers on it, and then you can scroll the page down and make it do what you want to do. But we need someone to teach us these new characteristics, these new skills. And we need someone to teach us how to walk in sync with the Holy Spirit. That's the role of the Holy Spirit is to make us become more like Jesus Christ by teaching us how to exhibit and practice these fruits of the Spirit that Paul mentions in verse 22. So the old adage comes in here that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. What exactly does that mean? It means that the longer that a person lives the way that they want to live, doing the things that they want to do, these habits set in, and it becomes more and more difficult to get out of those habits or those ways that we do things. The longer it takes to break those habits, the longer it is to learn a new habit. Some people say that it takes 30 days to start a new habit. I say sometimes it probably takes a lot longer than that. It depends on how long that habit has been in your life. The Holy Spirit teaches you this is something you shouldn't be doing. And you say, well, you know what? I've been doing that all my life. It's not going to happen overnight. He said, well, let's get to work on it. And that's exactly what it takes. It takes somebody coming along and walking beside us step by step pace by pace, marching, giving us that sync, giving us that cadence. Here's how you get out of that old, sinful, fleshly habit until it becomes routine and a new habit kicks in. 
So if you look at the two lists that Paul gives, uh, idolatry, you want to overcome idolatry? Well, let's go to the list of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, here you go. Let's work on those, and that'll get some of the idolatry out of you. You take some of those works of the flesh and say, you know what, I'm going to overcome it with the fruit of the Spirit. The older, the, the longer the old nature has rule and reign in a person's life, the harder the struggle is going to be. Therefore, here, listen closely to what I'm fixing to say. If a person does not yield their life to Jesus Christ until late in life, the more difficult it is to overcome some of those old fleshly habits and replace them with spiritual habits. Here's my point. Don't become neutralized out of frustration while attempting to overcome an old fleshly habit. Amen? You may say, Brother Tracy, I've been trying to break this habit for years, and you don't give up. If it's something that's been there for a long, long time, that's going to make it even more harder to overcome. And if you have that type of thinking, that is a stinking thinking that you can't overcome an old fleshly habit. If you have that mindset that you're never going to be able to overcome it, then the enemy has you neutralized in your walk and you're not going to go any further. Jesus said, who the Son sets free is free indeed. That's the mindset that you need to overcome that stinking thinking. That's the mindset that you need to have to not be neutralized in that old fleshly way. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You have a power living inside of you that wants to teach you how to overcome that old fleshly habit. Romans 6, 14, Paul says, Sin shall not have dominion over you because Jesus Christ has won the victory and he does not want you to be neutralized. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, Paul says, and if Christ is not risen, you are still dead in your sins. But he has risen. He has overcome death, hell, and the grave. And now he says, my Holy Spirit lives inside of you to help you overcome those old, sinful, fleshly habits. So here's the thing. Get out of those old, sinful habits as quickly as possible and don't become neutralized in your attempt to overcome them. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit, not neutralized, but able to learn, able to be taught by the power of the Holy Spirit. Learn from the spirit. Let the Holy Spirit walk up and down the aisles of your mind and teach you how to live for Jesus. Yielding to his longings for you to live a righteous and holy life and godly life, to not fulfill what your flesh is longing for and desiring you to do, you must allow free reign of the Holy Spirit in your life. You say, Holy Spirit, I want you to have access to every area of my life. Search me and find those things that are still worldly, still fleshly, those things that are attached to me that, that I can't shake. I want you to help me overcome those old, sinful, fleshly desires in my life. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 139. It's a familiar passage. It's two familiar verses I want to look at, but I think they fall in place so, so well with what we're talking about here. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. If you're having problems, if the, if the enemy has you neutralized in some area of your life, if you have not yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit to walk up and down 
the aisles of your mind and your heart and your spirit and your soul. Here's something you can pray. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Now, he knows your heart already. But when you pray something like that, you are giving the Holy Spirit free reign and access to every area of your heart. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. Verse 24, so, so crucial. And see if there is any wicked way in me. You might as well take that list from Galatians chapter 5 and insert it right there. Lord, see if there is any adultery, fornication, idolatry, sorcery, wrath, selfish ambition. Are there any of these ways in my life that I need to get rid of? Are there any of these habits that have me neutralized in my walk with Jesus Christ? See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. How long has it been since you prayed a prayer like that? How long has it been since you said, Lord, I am, I am neutralized, I'm stagnant, I'm stale, I'm not going anywhere. Search my heart and see what's going on and reveal any area of my life that I have not yielded to you because I don't want to be neutralized anymore. Or maybe you say, your spirit is paralyzed. What's the difference? Neutralized, you are still capable of moving, but something has you held back. Paralyzed means that you are totally incapable of doing anything on your own. So ask yourself that question right now. Is your spirit paralyzed? Verse 17, where did I get that from? What makes me think that our spirit could possibly be paralyzed in some way? For the lust, uh, flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary to one another. Look right here. So that you do not do the things you wish. New Living Translation says, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. You're not just neutralized, but you're paralyzed. Totally incapable of doing the things that you would rather be doing. Because your flesh is battling against your spirit. He says those two are contrary to one another. There is a war going on inside of you. And if you yield to the flesh rather than yielding to the spirit, you are going to be completely paralyzed and incapable of doing anything that the Lord wants you to do. When a body is paralyzed, the body is physically incapable of moving on its own. It can only go where someone else will take it. It can't breathe on its own. A lot of times it needs to be put on a ventilator. And it cannot do the things that it wishes to do. You remember what Jesus told the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he died? He asked that they would pray with him. He went a little ways further. And I think that applies to this situation as well. The context is a little bit different. But Jesus went away and he came back and he found them sleeping. Matthew chapter 26, verse 40, it says, Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And get this, the spirit indeed is willing, but what? The flesh is weak. You've been paralyzed. You've been neutralized. You set out with good intentions. Your spirit was willing to do it, but you got wrapped up in something else. You became paralyzed and weak. The Holy Spirit enables us to do the things that we want to do and need to do for the Lord. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said he will be our teacher, he would be our advocate, he would be our parakletos, the one that walks along beside us. There's a big difference between being neutralized and being paralyzed. When you're neutralized, you can still physically do 
some things, but when paralysis sets in, the body is totally incapable of doing anything on its own. And that's what Paul says here. He says, you do not do the things you wish. In other words, another power has incapacitated you. In other words, spiritual rigor mortis has set in. You're locked up. Your joints are tight. You can't move at all. You can't move a muscle. The issue at hand here is what many believers often fail to learn. And it's this. It's that when you get saved, you don't just lose your sinful nature that you were born with. A lot of people think that, man, if I get saved, all of those bad habits, all of those lusts, all of those cravings are going to be gone. That is simply not the case. There's nothing further from the truth from that. You don't just lose your sinful nature that you're born with. It still exists and it will exist until the day the Lord takes you out of this world. J. Vernon McGee in his commentary on this, he says the idea that we can get rid of that old nature is a tragic mistake. We let our guard down. We think we've conquered it. We think we've overcome it, but it's still there. It may be dormant for a while, but that old fleshly sinful nature still exists as long as we are in this earthly body. Here's what happens. Uh, John chapter 3, Jesus said, that which is of the flesh is flesh, and that which is of the spirit is spirit. When a person is born again, they take on a new nature on top of the old nature. That old nature, it still exists. And when that happens, guess what? The fight is on. <laughs> Man, you get born again, that, that spiritual nature comes in, that new nature comes in, and it's like, are you ready to rumble? <laughs> Let's get it on. And they are constantly fighting at one another. That's a big problem. When a person is born again, they take on a new nature on top of the old nature that still exists. One of them walks up to the other and says, you know what? This town ain't big enough for the two of us. <laughs> one of us has got to go. They begin to fight. The old nature is stubborn. It's resistant. It's been there for a long, long time. It likes it where it's at. It doesn't want to leave. We never get rid of our sinful desires that are contained in our old nature. So how do you know that, Brother Tracy? 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. It says, if we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's bad news, isn't it? Is there any hope? Who wins in that battle? There's a showdown going on. There's a, a fight. It says the two are contrary to one another. They are always butting heads. They can't get along. One wants the other one out. And there's a constant fight going on. Who wins? The one that you feed the most is going to be the biggest and the strongest and the baddest. If you are catering to the lust of the flesh, you're not praying, you're not getting into the word, guess what? All those that we just read in verses 20, 21, and 22, they're going to conquer every time. They're going to win. They're going to get the victory. However, if you feed that, that spiritual nature, if you're constantly in the... Give us this day our daily bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If Jesus had to use the word of God to overcome Satan, not just once, not just twice, but three times, how do you think you're ever going to win if you're not getting a daily dose of God's word? If you're not feeding that spiritual nature, it's never going to survive. The best analogy comes out of the uh, survival kit for new, uh, new Christians. Think of it as having two pets. Maybe you've got two dogs, two fish, two cats, whatever the case may be. If you feed one and water it, you take it to the vet, 
you keep it healthy, it's going to get strong and it's going to be. But if you neglect the other one, you don't feed it. You keep it locked up outside or in a cage in a dark room. Don't ever give it food or water. Guess what? Eventually it's going to fade away and it's going to die. Which one do you want to win? If you want the spiritual nature to win, you've got to feed it continuously. And if you want that old fleshly nature to die, you've got to starve it to death. Paul says that we become paralyzed when the flesh becomes contrary to the spirit. The New Living Translation puts it gently by saying they are simply opposite to each other, but the original language is much, much stronger than that. The word contrary in the Greek language means to be hostile towards. It means to be an opponent or an adversary. They are lined up in conflict. You've got two different truths marching at the same cadence, but they are headed for a collision course with each other. The army that's the strongest is going to be the one that emerges victorious. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul is trying to help the readers of this letter understand. You've got a battle going on inside of you. Is your spiritual nature paralyzed? Or is your sinful, lustful nature paralyzed? Once you figure out that you have to be walking in cadence with the Holy Spirit for him to be able to teach you and guide you and direct you, then you are being mobilized. If you're not neutralized, if you're not paralyzed, you're in sync with the Holy Spirit, he's going to keep you mobilized each and every day. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He's not going with the ungodly group, but he is marching alone. I've got me some godly friends. i got me some Christ-like followers. They're going in the right direction. I see the fruits of the Spirit exhibiting. I'm going to get in line with them. I'm going to get in line with that troop, but I'm going to march at the same beat, and I'm going to try my best to keep up with them every way. I'm going to be mobilized One of the songs we used to sing in Sunday school, I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. <laughs> you know it. I may never zoom over the enemy. That was always my favorite part. But I'm in the Lord's army. I am mobilized. I am equipped. I have the spirit, the gospel armor. I have God's word, my sword that I can attack the enemy with. I am mobilized. That's what the Holy Spirit teaches us. You've got to be moving. You can't get stagnant. You can't grow still. You can't be neutralized, and you can't be paralyzed. Now, here's something else that I want to point out. When we begin talking about the law and legalism, remember what the Apostle Paul said back in chapter 3, what the law was actually good for? He said, the law all this time has been what? Has it been a tutor for you? If you look back in chapter 3 of Galatians, he teaches that. We spent a whole sermon on that. He says, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Why? Because when faith comes, the Holy Spirit comes to be your teacher. <laughs> a tutor is just a supplement for what you should be learning. But the teacher is the one that teaches you the main lessons of life that you need to be learning. While the law has been tutoring all of this time, the Holy Spirit is now teaching what? What is he teaching? He's teaching application. There's a big difference between simply learning a lesson and actually applying that lesson. You see, to read something from the law is only half the effort. The crucial part is to apply what has been learned. I may know that the speed limit is only 55 miles an hour on this stretch of highway, but until I apply that law to my accelerator or my cruise control, I haven't applied what I know to actually exist. That's what the Apostle Paul is teaching here when he talks about the law being a tutor and we are no longer under that tutor. It is now time to apply the lessons that you have learned all this time. The only way that you can apply those lessons is to come under the influence of the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, your 
teacher in all things and walk in sync and in step with him. The Holy Spirit teaches us how to apply what the tutor has only revealed. And the Holy Spirit illuminates our mind to the depths of God's commands and the application of it. If you are led by the Spirit, he says, you are not under the law, the tutor. Verse 18. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Led by the Spirit. Are you being led by the Spirit? That means that you are mobilized. You are enlisted in the army. You're marching with the right troop. You're in sync with the Holy Spirit. New Living Translation says that you are directed by the Spirit. You remember how this chapter started off? Of course, this letter wasn't written in chapters and verses. But chapter 5, we started off with Paul saying, you, you got to stand fast in the liberty, this newfound liberty that you found. But now he's saying, you got to be mobilized. you got to be marching with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is leading you in the direction that you need to go in. And what is it in our life that actually demonstrates just how much we love the Lord or obedience? We have become doers of the word and not just hearers only. I, I've sat under the tutor for long enough. I, I came in Sunday morning. I, I got a good sermon. I've got my marching orders. Now I am mobilized. I am obligated to do what I have learned. I am obligated to put it into practice. I am now mobilized because not only do I hear, but I understand now it's time to apply what I have learned. Life transformation requires us to not fall for the temptations of the flesh, but to march according to what the Holy Spirit is instructing us to do. For transformation to actually occur, we must have application. For transformation to actually occur, we must live our lives by keeping in step with the Holy Spirit as he is guiding us and that his commands are our highest priority. As we're marching, we've got our eyes on Jesus. He's our commander in chief. He's the one that I want to be like. He's the one that's guiding the way, leading the battle to victory. We've got our eyes in his word as well. We are constantly seeing, what do I need to change? Search me, O Lord. Let your word wash over me and teach me the things that I need to learn. And through his command and our obedience, we then become mobilized to fulfill the great commission. And part of that great commission is what? To teach them all things I have commanded you. I've mobilized you. I've enlisted you. I've empowered you. I've equipped you. And now you go out and do the same for someone else. That's exactly what David said in Psalm 51, his prayer of repentance. Psalms 51, verses 12 through 13, he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Once you teach me how to march, once you mobilize me, once you get me going in the direction I need to go in, then I'll be able to teach others what I have learned along the way. Chuck Swindoll had a phenomenal quote here. I, I love this part. Man to man, his book that he wrote, he says, and I quote, your flesh, creative and cool as it is, will invariably remind you of a dozen ways to rationalize around the wrong of your lust. And there's a name for those who listen to those reasons, victim. Don't fall victim to the enemy's plot. Don't fall victim to his lies. Don't let him sit there and tell you you will never be able to overcome that old nature, that old habit. 
Because through Jesus Christ, we have the victory. And it is his Holy Spirit and the power of his Holy Spirit live inside of us. It's his word that reveals to us. Stand on his promises. Romans 6, 14. If you didn't learn any other verse, write this one down, memorize it. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under law, but under grace. As Nancy comes, I want to have a time of invitation tonight for you to respond to what you've heard. Maybe you're still struggling with something. Maybe it's a battle that you've been in for a long, long time now. With every, every head bowed and every eye closed, just the piano playing, no singing. Tonight, I want you to answer the question for yourself. Have I been neutralized by the enemy's lies? Have I fallen for his deceptive schemes or am I living in victory? Has my spirit been paralyzed because it just can't overcome those old habits and old ways? But maybe you're here tonight saying, Brother Tracy, I'm ready to be mobilized. I, I want you to pray for me that I'll have victory in this area in my life. Or maybe you just want to come to one of these altars and get along with the Lord and say, God, give me the victory over this area that I'm struggling with. The altars are open right now. You don't have to wait for the music to play. Whatever it is the Lord's leading you to do, you just come and get along and, with the Lord and deal with it. But this invitation is for anyone and everyone.